Thank you all for coming out to not only the first Tuesday tea of the spring semester, but also the first one we've had out in the galleries, as opposed to the East Gallery with the PowerPoint presentation for over a year now. I was figuring the last one we had in a gallery was Ellen Wurzel in December of 2011. So some of you might have been there for that. So it's been quite a while. Um, and uh, I want to thank you all for coming out. This um, is the second year that we've had a curatorial assistant in the Office of Academic Programs present as the February Tuesday Tea. And so this year, it's my pleasure to introduce Lucas Grippa, who just started in uh, in Liliana Makova's office in, I guess it was August, right? It was before the summer was out. And so he'll be on board for the academic year as the curatorial assistant there, helping Liliana with researching and preparing for class visits, um, leading and, and teaching classes himself, um, both in the French study room and also in the galleries here. Um, Lucas graduated with honors in May um, from Oberlin with a major in visual arts and minor in art history. And as a visual artist, his work is uh, greatly influenced by conceptual, minimalist, and earthwork artists of the last half century, which ties in very well, I guess, to what he'll be discussing today. Um, after completing his time here uh, with Liliana and with the Allen Art Museum, Lucas plans on pursuing graduate degrees in the arts, still in Europe, do you think? Anywhere. <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> so, all right, well, please join me in welcoming Lucas Bricka. instead emphasizes the element of process over that of product. Four Corners, constructed in 1972, is made of two materials, wood and hemp. Four enormous spheres of rolled hemp rope make up the majority of the sculpture, while four large logs of wood create the work's armature. These logs only show through a sliver of space, but are untreated and therefore fully covered in bark. The density of the balls of hemp, coupled with the apparent girth of the logs, give Four Corners a solid and, to quote Ellen Johnson, stubborn presence that make it identifiably a Windsor. In 1973, a year after the completion of Four Corners, Jackie Windsor exhibited this work in a show at the Allen Memorial Art Museum alongside artists Anne McCoy, Mary Miss, and Ree Morton. The show was one of the Young American Exhibitions curated by Helen Johnson and was installed the year she was appointed Curator of Modern Art at the Amen. Throughout her career, Ellen Johnson helped support and promote young artists who were beginning to make a name for themselves. I had the opportunity to interview Miss Windsor and asked about their relationship. Windsor recounted to me her memory of Miss Johnson as completely behind the scenes, saying, she created a huge presence in all the work she put together, but she was like the walls. She had a complete commitment and confidence in what she did, but never liked to be on stage. Working at the Allen Memorial Art Museum this year, I have come to deeply appreciate Ellen Johnson's contribution to this school and this museum. The opportunity to engage with the works she found so fascinating was what led to my interest in Four Corners. This exhibition, Religion, Ritual, and Performance in Modern and Contemporary Art, curated by our Assistant Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art, Denise Burkhofer, 
has helped me to think through the themes present in Four Corners. I have found that Windsor draws a strong distinction between performance and ritual, an issue that also interested Ellen Johnson. Windsor achieves the creation of her object through very repetitive physical actions, but in response to the term ritual being used to describe her process, she replied, I don't like the word, because in current use it can suggest mindless, heartless activities. What it seems to me Windsor is telling us through this comment is that she is always present and alert while making her work. She does not connect ritual to the trance-like understanding it is sometimes connoted with, but rather the attitude of mundane routine that so often gets associated with everyday life. Windsor strikes out against this attitude by addressing each action she makes with her body and mind, preserving her attentive engagement with her objects through their process. One explanation for Windsor's attitude toward ritual might be explored through her upbringing. Born in 1941, near St. John's, Newfoundland, Windsor grew up in the countryside. Her childhood involved many daily chores, which informed her interest in the labor-intensive objects she later created. Being constantly involved in the necessary physical activities of everyday life, Windsor grew up with a heightened awareness of the importance of these tasks. Her rejection of the term ritual might be more of an ideological disconnect between the absent-minded attitude taken towards chores and her revelry of them. Windsor explained to me that her art-making process required many little decisions. In the same way that the chores Windsor performed as a child could not be completed mindlessly, neither could her sculptures. Although we cannot always see every choice that Windsor made, her sculptures were created with an attention to detail that left the remains of those decisions ever present in her objects. When asked about the religious connotations of her work, Windsor replied, none of that was part of my thought process or my intent. But what I found was that the images that came up and the ideas I worked with, they came from themselves. It came out of innateness in myself. She explained to me that although she grew up Protestant, it never seemed to infiltrate her work. But once she got older, she realized retrospectively that a latent spirituality may have been present without her knowing. Windsor recounted to me the story of her trip to India, saying that during her time there, she crossed paths with spiritual ideologies that she recognized in herself. Her work may have not been religious in the sense of its utilization of iconography, but instead spiritual in its appeal to a universal aesthetic. Some have commented on Windsor's play on primitivism, play claiming that her works would be at home in a natural history museum. Perhaps in some way, Windsor deals with the spiritual rather than the religious by seeking forms that reference what we all recognize as fundamental structures of the world. Finally, I come to performance, which may be the most difficult of the three to deal with. Windsor's work is performative in that she performs tasks in order to complete her sculptures. The process is not theatrical, but rather an act of execution. Also, when we conceptualize the creation of her works, we complete the performance in our minds as well. But in order to fully under understand the extent to which performing her tasks is a part of Windsor's artistic interest, we have to examine her process more closely. In my interview with Miss Windsor, I asked about the creation of Four Corners, and I was struck by the emphasis she put on the work's formation from beginning to end. Her response to me revealed that the importance she places on process goes far beyond the tasks she performs in her studio. I quote, First off, I got the wood out in the countryside on the property of a friend of mine, Gary Keene. They were weeding out some of the trees for better growth, and they went over onto his property and some trees were felled. So I got these trees that were down, carried them to this truck bed, and dragged them into the city. It was very heavy wood, and they were big across, 12 or 14 inches. But I had a chainsaw, and I simply took a notch out, and they were notched together. Then I got this rope, four inch ocean liner, tie up to the dock rope. When you undo it, it is coarse, not too far away from the wood itself. 
It was bound on each corner, and I bound and bound until the hole in the center of the armature was about one inch. And so I built it up, wanting to fill that space in. Working four full days a week for six months, Jackie Windsor created four corners, finally finishing the sculpture once it reached the weight of about half a ton. In all this time, she did not make one drawing of the work, but instead remained focused on the task at hand. Windsor's unwavering dedication to her process is encoded in her objects and can be examined and unpacked through their visual elements. The amount of hemp rope, which is not very thick, expresses the effort put into the creation of this work. The, the spheres stand with 25 inch diameter, making them impressive not only as collections of material, but as objects made by hand. In no way do these wrap balls resemble the balls of yarn found in a knitting bag. This shows that they were attended to during their process, the process of their wrapping, with care and intention. A primary goal throughout the process of Windsor's wrapping was to make the, uh, sure the rope accumulated as densely as possible. Examining each ball of hemp, we see that they present us with traces of their own creation. Although they are spherical, the knots and interlocking weaving of each sphere is unique. Each hemp ball depicts various ways that the rope was wrapped to hold the shape of the sphere. In certain instances, wide groups of many strands of rope grip the exterior of each sphere and curve around the surface, eventually disappearing inward. In other cases, groupings of knots protrude from within each sphere, expressing the tension that the hemp rope is under. Following the path of the hemp, we map a series to decision, uh, to decisions to fold, knot, and interlock the rope discovering surprises and conundrums every step of the way. The surface of the sculpture instructs us to observe the actions performed by the artist, while simultaneously focusing our attention onto the dense interior. Exhausting the information on the surface of the sculpture, we realize there is a multitude of information occurring within each ball of hemp that we cannot see but that exists in our minds. Making four corners, Windsor had to tie knots with the hemp rope at certain points in order to eventually build up the spheres and make sure their form was as close to round as possible. At the end of each day of working, Windsor would tie a knot on the loose end of the rope and fasten it to the sculpture with a nail. When, we, when she would return in the morning, she would remove the nail and continue wrapping, leaving the knot as a record of that passing day. The physical presence of these actions make us aware of the spheres in a way that impregnates them with much more detail than we could have gathered from their uh, surface. Excuse me. Although the physical remnants of the tasks performed to complete the work are concealed, they are not hidden to us. Windsor chooses to sculpt her works by hand so that each one becomes this record of its own creation. Thinking back to her process, Windsor commented that throughout her career, she was always most interested in how you get from one thing to another. So, diverging from the final form of Four Corners, we can choose to follow the trajectory of its creation back to its original elements. In the most basic sense, Four Corners started as one thick line, a tree, and one thin line, a rope. Windsor explained to me that drawing was a great influence to her at art school. And although she never made any preliminary sketches for her sculptures, the reason might be because they are drawings in and of themselves. Starting with the tree and the rope, we might be able to conceive of four corners as a drawing rendered in three dimensions. The work also alludes to transformation through its title. Although we are able to conceptualize the four corners that exist underneath the balls of hemp, they are no longer present on the exterior of the work. The sculpture, in fact, has no corners at all, making the title all the more evocative. The title points to the work's evolution from a structure that was characterized by its four corners to one that only suggests them. By drawing our attention to the work's process of transformation, we are led through its development from one thing to another, and therefore aware of the necessary evolution of form that is instrumental to Windsor's process. By mapping the creation of Four Corners, we are able to interpret more meaning from the work than just from its appearance to us now. John Yao writes, 
It is this gap between the work and contemplating one's incomplete knowledge of it that all kinds of possible meanings arise to the surface of our consciousness. Taking a step back, we might wonder about the art historical lens framing Windsor's work. Through our visual analysis, we have observed the simple geometries as well as the evocative materiality of the sculpture. This speaks to Windsor's association with the post-minimalists. Artists such as Eva Hesse, whose sculpture the Lack One stands behind us, and Richard Serra, whose installation Two Cuts was featured in last year's exhibition, helped pioneer the post-minimalist movement. These artists, like the minimalists, were interested in primary form but they felt that cold and authoritative attitude of their predecessors needed to be reinterpreted. They achieved this by using materials that were not industrially polished to perfection, but instead organic and emotive. These artists evoked the body through their expressive materials and also placed focus on the act of creation. Being completely made from organic matter, Four Corners produces bodily functions, Although subtle, the smell of the hemp rope activates our sensory perception most closely associated with our memory. This quality of the work makes it so that each one of us experiences four corners personally. Whatever the association that gets brought to mind, the power of the work to engage us all in the act of remembering reminds us that we are in the presence of something familiar. Locating the smell of the object we realize that Windsor has given form and identity to what we experience as a sensory encounter. Four Corners gathers personhood by embodying our memories and enacting our sense of empathy. This is not to say that we see ourselves in the work, but rather that the sculpture develops livingness through our multi-sensory experience of it. The living quality that Jackie Windsor's object, objects exude comes from her intention to create what she described to me as a heart in her objects. Anchoring us through a physical experience, Four Corners draws us towards its center. This phenomenon might be explained by the process of compaction she enacts in the creation of her works. By tightening the rope as she wraps it over and over itself, Windsor moves material inward, thus producing the same behavior from us. The hemp rope also visually points us toward the center of the work. Looking down at the sculpture from above, we notice that Windsor gives the rope directionality, mimicking a wood, um, the wood grain of the logs. Windsor's use of scale also suggests a physical reading. Working on objects she describes as bodily, she engages us in a kinesthetic relationship with her work. By this, I mean that Windsor enacts our ability to sense and locate parts of our body in relation to her sculpture by creating objects that strike us as human in size. One way this effect is achieved in Four Corners is through its reference to traditional furniture measurements. The height and the width of the work are exactly that of a table for four. I know that may seem strange, but um, it does, in fact, work out that way. <laughs> Although this may help us understand why we experience a physical response to Four Corners, Windsor vehemently rejects a functional reading of her sculpture. When Four Corners was originally purchased, the buyer was interested in placing a glass surface on top of the work so that he could turn it into a coffee table. This was Windsor's first sale. But rather than allow her work to become a piece of furniture, she drafted a contract that she used from then on that required all her works to be displayed as they appeared in the gallery. She explained to me that she had to figure out a way for her objects to demand a level of respect and consideration that would retain their sense of livingness. Windsor felt at the time that the only way to achieve this was through high prices and limitations. <laughs> As Jackie Windsor's work developed, the themes of process, materiality, and interiority remained ever-present. Four Corners, being one of her bound works, is, um, is considered a necessary stepping stone from her early, earlier rope sculptures to her later cube ones. Dean Sobel likened her career 
to the human maturation process claiming, the earlier self-evident pieces are like the openness of childhood. The transitional secret ones evoke the withdrawals of adolescence, and the later inside-outside cubes suggest a paradigm of adulthood. Her bound works in this statement would be considered the transitional secret ones. Sawbell saw the concealed interiors of this period as an adolescent trait of the work because for him it both invited and repelled us. Windsor commented on Sobel's reading of her career, saying her intention was always to make the work become more of itself. Letting the voice of her objects ex express their needs, Windsor's work matured through her attentive communication with her process. Her next step as an artist after the Bound works was to reveal the interiors of her sculptures through the creation of windows. She fabricated cubes that invited us to peek inside and discover what lay beneath, developing multifaceted readings of the work. Sometimes this meant experiencing a painted surface on the exterior and a charred wood and cement structure within. Making this distinction between surface and interior, we now see four corners more clearly through the lens of the artist. Windsor is not concerned with an exact experience of her works but more broadly, the potential for varying relationships. As her career progressed, Windsor explored many ways that we reconcile the inside and the outside of an object, but she remained entrenched in her process and the performance of her tasks as an artist. Now that I've outlined some of Windsor's fundamental interests, we can finally pose the question, why is Four Corners relevant now? Considering the introduction of digital media and technology into the art world, we could say that Four Corners is making a statement about the relevance of the analog. It is nearly impossible to find areas of our lives that the technological revolution has not touched. Constantly communicating through virtual realities, the privilege of someone's actual physical presence is sometimes altogether unfamiliar. As the digital realm infiltrates our daily lives, we have found ways to adjust and make contact with one another, even if through cyberspace. But this does not mean we are not aware of the importance of the body. Windsor worked to build objects that through their nurtured creation nearly came to life. Reflecting back on her process, we notice she was working against the first signs of the technological mediation of our relationships. Using organic materials and working on a bodily scale, Windsor create works of art that deal with contemporary themes while maintaining what Walter Benjamin refers to as the aura. Her works are grounded in their physicality to the extent that they exude more than just a commanding presence, but perhaps something like a soul. Rather than complicate or intellectualize her subject matter, Windsor develops the energy of an object until it can stand alone with a commanding presence. The emphasis she puts on the act of creation is self-referential in that it begs to be re-examined over and over. As we are led through this performance, we physically experience the works as accumulations of energy through action over time. Maybe the reason Ellen Johnson referred to Four Corners as having a stubborn presence is because it refuses to not exist. Recently, a single thread of twine broke free from the work and lay on the ground next to it. It was immediately attended to and fastened back into the sculpture. But I think that one missing piece of rope would hardly compromise the integrity of this work. Thinking about this single moment of deterioration in the last 40 years and all the rope that was used to create this work, we become aware of the years and years it is going to take to eventually destroy Four Corners. The reason this sculpture will continue to be relevant is simply because it will continue. There is no on-off switch to this piece or hazardous material used to cause its demise. The only thing wearing on Four Corners is time, which was the most abundant material used to create it. Thank you.